In the comments on this channel, I often get asked what my favorite book of all time is. Surely it must be something by Clark, Heinlein, or Asimov, you might think. But in reality, the story that I really respect and has stayed with me since childhood is arguably the start of both the science fiction and gothic horror genres. It's Frankenstein or the Modern Prometheus by Mary Wollenstonecraft Shelley. First published in 1818, this remarkable story was very far ahead of its time in many ways, drawing from the cutting edge, quite literally, science of the day. The idea of reanimating the dead actually came from a demonstration of shocking animal parts, such as frog legs, into movement that were being done at the time. Macabre as those experiments sometimes were, they did validate an electrical component to life on Earth. This has sometimes been taken too far, however, both in Shelley's time and now. For example, urban legends now exist, of which there are many variations that get disseminated on YouTube. Of Mary Shelley having experimented on a dog that she kept alive for months after grafting the appendages of various animals to it after amputation, until it eventually ran off and escaped. That's not going to happen now, at least very viably and successfully. It was definitely not going to happen in 1818 before the advent of antibiotics. Modern urban legends aside, there were also the settings of the novel, in specific, the Arctic. These conditions had been known to a degree from previous attempts at finding the Northwest Passage, and indeed humans had lived in the Arctic for thousands of years. But in Europe it was still very much the early days of Arctic research that were unfolding in her time, and there was much speculation. Providing one of the settings in the novel, decades before Ross, Shackleton, and the ill-fated Franklin expeditions really attempted to document these areas. And of course, little was done to employ the help of those already living there. The premise of Frankenstein at the time was disturbing and, in reality, still is. The idea of reanimating dead tissue by sewing it together from various sources and shocking it back to life, leading to unknown results is still very much relevant in a world where we flirt with advanced biotechnology. Frankenstein is a story that has ultimately aged very well. But interestingly, as we've progressed scientifically over the last two centuries, we still don't know entirely what the premise of Frankenstein actually entails if we were to actually try something like it, at least in a modern sense. We do know that to a degree, it is scientifically viable to reanimate something, and there are a number of ways to do it. One obviously is advanced medical science that can revive someone in the process of death, with such Frankenstein-like tools as electrical defibrillators. That's really using electricity to correct a malfunctioning heart, it has its limits, but it is akin to the early ideas that fed Shelley's work. Shocking frog legs told us that resetting hearts with electricity could work, and it did. But in the years since, we've seen glimpses of actual true reanimation. Medical science is littered with cases of apparent death, only for the formerly deceased to wake back up. And we've seen breakthroughs in cooling victims whose hearts have stopped to buy time for further medical intervention, lessening the effect of racing the clock for life-saving medical treatment. Techniques are now being developed for organ transplantation that can freeze and then reanimate individual donated organs, again to lessen the effect of racing the clock for transplantation. Recently, animal studies have shown that these techniques can actually see the revival of an organ after over a month of being frozen. So we know that some variations of the themes of Frankenstein are possible, but probably the most marked example here is cryonics. Here since the 1960s, some people have opted to be frozen within minutes after death in hopes that medical science in the future can revive them. After all, dead and in the grave is one thing, but frozen in the grave is another, even if there is even a tiny glimmer of hope for future revival. But this is still untested, uncharted territory that very much gets into Mary Shelley's thinking in a modern context, and that there's no guarantee that these people, if successfully revived, will even remember who they are or were, or anything else. We simply don't know what the effect of long-term freezing will be on the brain, and how that relates to the preservation of memory. On the other hand, if you can upload the memories of a person to a computer, does that matter anymore? Can they be loaded back in? And if they are, does the same person result? It doesn't seem likely that it would, rather it would be like Frankenstein, something new from the materials of the old. If the memories aren't intact in the biological, well, reinsert them upon revival. But that leads to a terrifying possibility. Would you really want all of your memories stored in a data farm for anyone to hack even after death? 
would have recorded one's memory in a sanitized form to be re-downloaded into the thawed and revived body. Are you really you at that point? Or are you an idealized, at least for now, revived human being approximating what you once were? Maybe death is death no matter what you do. Maybe it's like a standing wave, and once the human has gone past a certain point, it's gone and you can only ever be approximated as a copy. But we can already see glimmers of what might eventually be. Actors like Tom Hanks have speculated, rightly because it's already happening, see Star Wars Rogue One with the reanimated visages of Peter Cushing and Carrie Fisher, that he will continue acting perhaps long after his death because of deepfakes and CGI. That's only the beginning, but it won't actually be Tom Hanks. The human will be gone, and the approximation will continue. But that's not really that different from an actor that was not Queen Elizabeth I playing her in a fictional setting. Often the idea of reanimation relies on future nanotechnology that we're not entirely certain we'll ever actually be able to develop. Yes, there is an age of nanotechnology coming in some form, and things will continue to miniaturize until we reach the great brick wall that is working with individual atoms. But just how we can apply it medically is still unknown. This is one of the great pitfalls of predicting future technology, biotech, because biology is not fully understood and is really complicated. Yes, in principle, you should be able to directly repair a cell with a nanobot, but as with anything medical, we have no idea what the complications, side effects, and unintended consequences are going to be. In short, we might still be able to build nanobots, but injecting them into bloodstreams may create more problems than they solve. Until we know more, we can't say anything other than it holds promise. But many other things in the past have held promise and didn't work out in practice. Complications can occur in technological development. And then there is the question of suspended animation and space travel, vitrification, or the chemically aided freezing of a person for revival, features broadly in many forms in science fiction. But there's a hard problem with actually doing that. Over time, even while frozen, a human will accumulate a fatal radiation dose just from the radioactive elements naturally present in the body. This is not a problem for a few thousand years of freezing, but it is for longer. You can mitigate it to a degree by eliminating the radioactive isotopes of things like potassium from your body before freezing, but very probably imperfectly. Again, nanotechnology has to be introduced here to curate and repair the cellular damage that will occur no matter how cold a body is kept. It might be far simpler just to grow or 3D print new humans upon arrival at the destination and then program them for their new environments from scratch or from a stored genetic code. Maybe space travel of interstellar colonization never involves anyone physically traveling, rather the data of their DNA does the traveling, and the whole thing is more a matter of reconstruction and biological programming, call it a space nursery and school, rather than anyone ever leaving their star system. But within this there is another dimension. Say for example we found past evidence of microbial life on a moon in the solar system, or Mars, or even current microbes somewhere. We're going to want to study that, obviously, and we'll do anything we can to culture that extraterrestrial life and try to understand its genetics, and prove that it really represents a distinct abiogenesis from Earth. Chances are, if it's fossil life on Mars, then we're going to run into the Jurassic Park problem. We might find evidence of the microbes, perhaps fossil microbial mats, and we'd learn a lot about it, but the DNA itself needed to reconstruct it would be long gone. In Jurassic Park, the idea of extracting DNA from fossilized insects in amber, fossilized tree resin, is interesting. But in reality, it's not likely to ever be doable. The older the DNA, the more it simply falls apart, and recovering it is almost hopeless. Not so for recently extinct species, however, such as the thylacine. But for the dinosaurs, you'd have to figure out the complexities of their genetics and build one from the ground up. But this idea can be taken a bit further protection of genetic codes for artificial panspermia. Genetics are a natural way to store information, but an imperfect one, in that once it's gone, it's no longer reproducing in its framework. Then it risks true extinction. As long as you have life, the genetic data can be kept going. But once it's gone, you only have a relatively short period of time to preserve or resurrect it because it's just too delicate to preserve in the fossil record for very long. But data storage in the sense of computers can extend that immensely. Instructions on how to create a DNA strand will outlast the DNA strand itself. This opens up the idea of artificial panspermia and resurrection by technological means. We may someday search the galaxy and find dead aliens, 
we may not be able to bring them back in a real and practical way. But if we found the data of their mapped genome, that's a bit better of a proposition. In other words, an extinct intelligent alien species could in principle be brought back, if enough information were present to do it. This of course also suffers from the Frankenstein problem though. They likely would have no ability to remember anything from their former civilization, unless such things were encoded in their genetics. Instinctual memory may be possible, but they would not be that civilization, even if brought back. Even still, the idea is alluring, that somewhere in the galaxy we might find a frozen or otherwise preserved alien, maybe killed by something else, even more mysterious and dangerous, as that in the Alien franchise. Maybe we could resurrect it in species, but not an actual person, and use that to study the actual alien life biologically, but know little of their culture, other than what their spacecraft can tell us. But what it might not tell us is what attacked it, and as to what did, does it yet lurk out there, awaiting us to encounter it? Thanks for listening. I am futurist and science fiction author John Michael Godier, currently wondering about the reanimation of technology. That would be far easier than biology. And I wonder if there will come a day in the future when updated, modernized versions of past technology may come into vogue. Mark my words, the best days of the Chrysler LeBaron are yet to come. And be sure to check out my books at your favorite online book retailer and subscribe to my channels for regular in-depth explorations into the interesting, weird, and unknown aspects of this amazing universe in which we live.